So where we let off, left off last time was trying to um, make mouse over menus, and we were like most of the way there. And the reason I like this example is this example really shows how the three pieces of client-side technologies work together. Because we have the, the text of the menu, the actual content of the menus, all the text and the links and so on, are in HTML. And that's what HTML is responsible for. Um, it's responsible for two things, really. It's responsible for the content, and it's responsible for the logical organization. So in other words, we have things grouped into lists that form the different menus and submenus. And that is done via the HTML. We have behavior or interactivity, different way to put it, and that is done via the JavaScript. And by behavior or interactivity, typically that means the user invokes some piece of JavaScript through some action that the user takes. So in our example, the action the user takes is they put their mouse over something. It could be other things as well, though. It's not just that. Um, and then the JavaScript, what it does is it changes the existing page. All right? Remember we had the model, the client scripting model uh, up on the board, client server scripting model on the board. We talked about how the server side scripting was responsible for making a web page. It took all the different various factors and assembled them together uh, according to some recipe or some script and came up with a web page uh, distinct to that particular situation. So a Google search is going to look different depending on what you put in the search bar. All right? It's going to look different depending on where you are. All right? um, but it's still going to be a web page. It's still going to be an HTML page that gets sent, sent back to the client. And what JavaScript typically is responsible for is taking a current, currently existing web page and changing it somehow, altering it, um, based on some action the user takes and, and so on. So in our case, the user puts their mouse over an item and we take something that previously was invisible and make it visible again. So let's pull up the example from last time. And if I remember right, the only thing we really needed to do is make the CSS work for this. user puts our mouse over a menu item it appears the other menu item it appears now the problem that we run into is because there's a gap between the menu items we can never go and click on the sub menu all right so we'll address that um, via the CSS because that's a positioning issue if these things were right on top of each other right next to each other then we'd be able to, to mouse over to the one um, and still have it appear so that's really our last challenge so I'm going to go open this up. And there's a bunch of ways that we can do this. 
I'm going to try to emulate the ESPN one where, um, well, sort of emulate the ESPN one where I'm going to make the menus oriented horizontally. So, this will serve largely as a CSS review. Um, the thing to remember about CSS is you need to have confidence or faith that almost anything you want to do, you are able to do. All right? So, for example, if we want the menus to be oriented horizontally, so we want the menus to go this way instead of stacked vertically, there's a way to do that. Does anyone, does anyone recall how I can make those menus be oriented horizontally? Uh, you want to go display in line. Display in line or display in line block. And there's a slight difference between the two. There's two kinds of tags basically in HTML, inline and block. Inline get put side by side, block gets stacked on top of each other. Now, I could do this a couple different ways. All right, I could go in and put IDs or classes on the LIs that I wanted to be stacked horizontally. But with HTML5, we have a higher degree of control over applying our CSS because of the new tags. I basically want every LI within my navigation section to be oriented horizontally. All right? So, in the old days, when you, everything was in a div, then you needed to put an ID or a class or something to differentiate between the different sections of your page. Now, with HTML5, Everything isn't a div. In other words, if we were to add another section of this page, it would probably be, we would probably have a header and a footer and, um, you know, an article or a section or whatever instead of a bunch of divs. So I can simply say, within the nav section, every li, I want the display to be Inline dash block. Inline block is sort of a cross between inline and block. It allows you to do things like set the margin and width and, and things like that, where normally it allows you to set some properties that you normally can't set on an inline tag. So usually if I do that, um, I'll use inline block instead of just straight inline. So there we have that and that. Now you notice a couple of little things. For one, submenu two is a little bit further below submenu one. Does anyone know why that is? Because it's still going off the default Yeah, it's still what it's doing is if you make the if you make the visibility hidden, it makes it invisible. All right. But it still takes up the space that it would have taken. All right. So both of these are set to have a visibility of hidden. They're both, quote, there. You just can't see them. So the menu takes up this, the, the first submenu takes up this space, and the second submenu takes up that space. There's an alternative way that will probably work a little better for our purposes, and that is display of none. Display of none means it's not there at all. All right, it doesn't even take up the space. So I'm going to go and I'm going to change this from visibility hidden, which we could get to work, but we could probably get it to work a little simpler if we say display of none. So now, oh, then I'm going to have to change my JavaScript from visibility hidden to display inline block.
back working. should say none. over, it's there. Put our mouse over the other one, the second one is there. Now the problem is, is we still have that little problem of there being a little gap between the two. Alright. This is where what I find useful is putting in um, either a border or a color or both for these, these things. Because then I can see actually where they really are. Alright. I can see actually where they really are. Um, and I can see that there actually is a little gap between these two. So even though they look like they're right on top of each other, there's actually a little space that when we move our mouse, we can't see it. So just for temporarily, I'm going to go and I'm going to add a color, let's say, to each of the... Um, submenus. And I could do it a few different ways, but I could say UL background gray. Let's make it more obvious. Yellow. And then LIs, I'm going to make a background of red. see there's actually a gap between them. All right. So as we go in that white area, the mouse is out of one and the mouse is not yet into the other one. So it disappears and we can't bring it back up. <coughs> How can we fix this? What's the issue here? They're right on top of each other in the HTML, and yet there's a space between them. You've got some sort of default margin. So there's some sort of default margin. Could be padding, I suppose, but probably margin. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to put a margin of zero pixels on each of these. sort of um, CSS debugging tip number one is if things don't look exactly the way that you expect or you're not really sure why something is happening, go back in and add a margin and, 
uh, or I'm sorry, go back and add a background color or a border. Then you can see exactly what's going on. All right. Now, here's a question. If we wanted to, notice how these are now like literally right on top of each other. Now that's good for our mouse over effect, but it might not be as readable as it could be or should be. How could we put a little bit of space there and still keep it so that when we put our mouse from one to the other, it stays on? Yes. And what would that accomplish? I am not going to say no on that, although I'm not sure that would work. But I'm not going to say yes either because that's more work than we need to do. All right? You know, look at me. I'm lazy, right? I mean, it should be obvious, right? Um, that's more work than we need to do. Um, as a general rule, you don't want to add extra HTML just to, like, get it to work. You should be able to do it with, I mean, this is the HTML we need, right? This is logically what this page consists of, a navigation section, and it has three unordered lists. Each of those lists have a couple of list items. To go and add a div and all that, you're adding something on the page that doesn't really need to be there, doesn't add any additional meaning. Now, we know the right answer isn't to add a margin to this, right? Because if we add a margin to that, then we'll be back to the problem we had before, where there would be a gap between those. So what could we add instead? Padding. Add a padding, right. So I could go in and say padding. Maybe five pixels. And then... We get them spaced out a little bit, but we still have the effect. How could we spread them out a little bit? Notice how there's a space, a little bit of space. How we could, could we get more space between it? margin left, right. I mean, correct. You could also set a page width and have it align on auto have up center across the page horizontally. All right, we could we could do that as well. We could yeah we could we could set um, a page width um, of a certain size and center it um, that way. Right. So there's some gaps in between those and all that. All right. Any questions about this? Now, here's the interesting thing. Again, first of all, let's, let's review this and let's point out the roles that each of the three technologies uh, accomplish. Number one, content is in HTML. What do we have here? Well, we have a navigation. So we have a nav tag. We have three separate men, uh, menus. What's a menu? A menu is really a list of items. So we have three unordered lists. Each of those unordered lists have a couple list items in it that happen to be links. So the HTML has the actual content of the page. The CSS allows us to control the, uh, um, let's back up for one second. In addition to having the actual content of the page, the HTML contains the logical organization. In other words, these two links are part of a unit, so they're both part of a UL tag. These two links are part of a unit, therefore they're part of a UL and so on. So logical structure and content is in the HTML. The CSS has us um, 
anything about the physical appearance and physical layout, how it's going to look on the page. So in this case, for this to work, they need to be right on top of each other, stacked right on top of each other, and we wanted them to be horizontal. So we changed the CSS to be make these things um, have a um, orientation of horizontal instead of vertical, and we got rid of the margins between them so they'd be stacked uh, right on top of each other. All right. Um, last but not least, and probably most important for this class, the JavaScript scripting. All right. User event. Those are going to start with on. All right. On something. All right, and I think we looked at a list of the events, but it would probably be good to look at another, uh, look at the list again. They all start with the word on. Here are some common ones. On change. On click, on mouse over, on mouse out, on key down, and on load. So there's some things you can do when the page finishes loading. All right, you would use the on load for that. On key down, you could use when you're typing. Anyone's a Twitter user, it shows you a countdown of how many characters you have left, right? Because you have 140 characters. That would be done on the on key down, or actually, it's probably done on the on key up. It's a subtle difference between those two, but you actually haven't finished typing until you've lifted your finger. <laughs> All right? So actually, if it's counting the characters on key up, actually is the one that you would use. On mouse over, on mouse out. And then again, here's a full list of those events that you have. They all correspond to basic actions that the user can perform. Um, on load, I guess, doesn't really relate to a specific user action other than the fact that, yeah, the user requested the page, and when it finishes loading, it does that. But on mouse over, on mouse out, all these are the ways that the user interacts to the page. So those are attributes of whatever HTML element the user is going to interact with. In this case, the, the user is interacting with the list items. Now, here's a question. Why do you suppose I put the on mouse over on the list item instead of on the link itself? All right? Because I could have put the on mouse over on the link tag, but I didn't. I put it on the li tag. Why do you suppose I did that? Because that way it affects the entire box instead of just the link itself. The entire box instead of the link itself. So in other words, notice how I put my mouse here. I'm not on the link, if you look really closely. I'm like a few pixels below the link. And yet, the mouse over effect works. If I put it on the link itself, I'd have to be right on the link. And then I would have the problem of if I move through the padding of the LI, it would disappear. All right? So I deliberately put it on the LI for that reason, just so I, didn't have, I wouldn't have to worry about the links, padding and margin and that sort of stuff. All I needed to worry about is the LIs. All right? Made, it, made my life a little simple. All right. So you have your user event, on mouse over, in this case, and on mouse out. You then have in quotes a piece of JavaScript. All right? In this case, we have a single JavaScript instruction. Now, this is going to get more complicated as we do more uh, involve things where we may have more than one Java piece of piece of JavaScript or more than one JavaScript instruction that we want to do. If you think, for example, of a page uh, validation, 
right? A form validation. Um, if there was a if there was a form for you you know name, a form for address, city, state, zip, and all that, there's going to be a bunch of lines of instructions in there. It's going to be a line to check the name, a line to check the address, city, state, zip, and so on down the line. All right. Here, we're doing just one thing. So I put my JavaScript statement within the quotation marks. All right. Now, notice a couple things. First of all, I use double quotes to indicate the beginning and end of my JavaScript statement. I then use single quotes within the JavaScript. What do I put within quote, quote, single quotes within the JavaScript? Well, that can be confusing sometimes, but essentially I put in values of things, not instructions. So instructions do not appear in quotes within a JavaScript statement, but, but values of things do. So for example, document get element by ID, that's an instruction. So it's not within single quotes. Submenu 1 is a value of something. It's the value of an ID. And therefore, that is put within quotes. Dot style, dot display, again, is part of the instruction. It's a property that we're changing. Equals is an equal sign. Inline block is the value that we're changing it to. So values we put within quotes. And again, we use this double quotes to indicate the beginning and end of the piece of JavaScript, if we need quotes inside the double quotes, we use single quotes. If I were to use a double quote here, for example, the browser would think that the JavaScript statement went from here to here, and it would blow up, obviously, because that's not a complete JavaScript statement. Now, this portion of the expression, document, Get element by ID is one that you should like learn and learn well because this is one of the key statements in JavaScript. What this allows you to do is it allows you to point to something on the page. Remember, JavaScript is all about taking an existing page and changing it. Well, how do you change a page? Well, you point to something on the change and say, I want to do something different to this. I want to change either the content of it or I want to change the appearance of it. In this case, we want to change the appearance of that particular um, element of the page, the thing that has the ID of submenu 1. Not submenu 2, not the main menu, but submenu 1. So we have to point to the thing we want to change. And document get element by ID, submenu 1, says this is what we are interested in. This is what we are pointing to. Submenu 1. All right. So it knows that any instructions, the rest of the instruction applies to this guy, submenu 1, not submenu 2 or anything else on the page. We then specify what is it we want to change. We want to change the style of it. We want to change the display. And what do we want to change it to? Equals, we have the value that is enclosed in quotes. Now notice, Dot style means we're changing something about the style of that page. What are we changing? The display property. Display. So that's not a coincidence. That's the same style display property that we set up in our CSS. So we give it an initial value in our CSS and we change that value through our JavaScript. So if I want to change the background color, I would say style.backgroundcolor. 
It's the same properties that are in the CSS that we're changing here in the JavaScript. Now, common errors and how to find those errors. All right. First thing, JavaScript is case sensitive. So, this is a command, document get element by ID. And the case of the letters are exactly as I have it. A lowercase d, a lowercase g, a lowercase e, I'm sorry, I'm sorry a lowercase g, an uppercase e, an uppercase b, an uppercase i in get element by ID. If you don't follow that, you'll get an error. This is known as camel casing because when camels type on the keyboard, they make the first letter lowercase, and then each word after that, they make none it's just a joke. All right. Camel case means the first letter of a word or, or command or whatever is lowercase then each subsequent word is uppercase, the first letter, and then the rest are lowercase. So get element by ID, you know, you don't have to memor, you know, if you know the command is get element by ID, you don't have to memorize which letters are upper and lowercase, it's automatic. The G is lowercase because it's the first letter. The E is uppercase because it's the first letter of the second word. The B uh, in by is uppercase because that's the first letter of the third word. The I in ID is uppercase because it's the first letter of the next word. If I don't do that and I make a mistake and I say get element by ID and I make the D uppercase, then it's going to break it. So I put my mouse on it, and nothing happens. All right? Now, this is a good one to memorize because that's a common error if you get the case wrong. Now, how do you know what your error is if it doesn't work? Well, one thing to do is to check the obvious. Check the spelling, you know, you know if you spelled element wrong. something like that, you know, check the spelling. If it's something that you've created, like submenu1, make sure that it matches what you've called that thing, submenu1. But beyond that, you know, you can glance at that, but it's a good idea to use a more systematic way of looking for errors. So don't just simply stare at your code, is the bottom line. That is a very inefficient way of finding problems. Instead, now every browser is a little bit different, but if you go in within Chrome, if you click on these three little lines up here, and you'll see more tools, and you'll see developers tools, if you click on that, it will show you some stuff. And specifically under consoles it will say uncaught type error. Document get element by ID is not a function. Now, this is where sometimes you wonder is the browser trolling you? Because it's pretty obvious the mistake is that you use the lower uh, uppercase D instead of a lowercase D. It's telling you that in its own way. In other words, it's telling you, hey, I don't recognize get element by I capital D. So that's sort of a hint, hmm, I thought there was a get element by ID function. That's sort of a hint to say go and check the case of it. So if I do that and fix it, then notice the error goes away and it starts working again. I can almost guarantee that if you come up to me and say some JavaScript isn't working, 
all right? I'm going to ask you what error are you getting? You know, what is the specific error that you are getting? Because a lot of times, you know, students kind of forget about this until you've gone through it a few cycles, you know, and done it a few times. You know, you're liable to forget the tools that you have at your disposal, all right? So, systematic way of doing things, you know. Don't simply stare at it, you know. If you were to go to the doctor with a complaint, you know, you, you had upset stomach or whatever, you know, the doctor isn't just going to stare at you and say, I think you got the flu or whatever. The doctor is going to do some tests, right? He's going to listen to your symptoms, you might run a blood test or whatever, you know, MRI, x-rays, whatever, and then they'll have a solution. Use the tools that you have available, all right? Another common error is if you don't match the name of something. So if I misspelled submenu1 and said submen1, I put my mouse over it. Cannot read property style of null. Again, not a very clear explanation initially, but null is another way of saying it doesn't exist. All right? So what it's telling you is, hey, there's no such thing as a style of something that doesn't exist. All right? Why doesn't it exist? Oh, I spelled it wrong. Try and make some other errors. What if instead of inside block, I say... Yeah, well, inside BL or something like that. This is a tougher one, right? Because it doesn't give me an error. All right. And yet it doesn't work. Why doesn't it give me an error? Well, because syntactically our statement is correct. Document get element by ID sub menu one. Yeah, I can find that thing. Yeah, it knows it has a style property. Yeah, it knows it has a display property of the style. What's wrong is the specific value. So it sets it to inline BL. Unfortunately, the browser has no idea what to do with something with that. So therefore, unfortunately in this case, it doesn't give me an error. And I would have to look at that. When we get into longer JavaScript statements or, or, or functions or whatever, um, typically what we'll do is we'll comment out one or two at a time. Because at some point, you might have to stare at your line of code. But it's better to stare at one line of code than to stare at 20 lines of code. So you want to narrow it down to the one line of code that you have some issue with before you stare it. Let's make another mistake. Let's say I forget to put, I put these in double quotes instead of single quotes. Unexpected token. A token is just another word for like a character that JavaScript sees. In this case, let's try to read its mind. It thinks that that's a whole JavaScript statement, and it gets confused when it sees that. Because that's outside the JavaScript statement. It thinks that's part of the HTML, and frankly, it doesn't know what to do with the parenthesis there. So, the point I'm trying to make is <coughs> that looking at the error console won't necessarily automatically say, hey, you used the wrong quote. Hey, you used the wrong value for the ID. Or you capitalized the wrong letters. It won't necessarily jump out in your face like that and tell you the error. But it does give you a hint of what's wrong. All right? And you can use that to 
more closely examine and come up with a better answer. Now what you should do, another good reason for looking at the Error Council, is over time you'll start to understand its cryptic way of expressing error messages. All right? So, oh, it said there's not a property style of null. That means I got the ID wrong because I'm trying to point to something that doesn't exist on the page. That's what it means when it says null. It can't find that thing. All right? Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing. What we have here can very easily be tweaked to be what I think your next assignment is. All right? Your next assignment is to, you have the assignment to do this week of using a style sheet switcher. All right? And that should be pretty straightforward as long as you follow the instructions and get things named the way that the script expects you to. But, your assignment that I made this week that's due next week is to put tabs on your page. And really, what do I mean by that? Well, each of those tabs, it swapped out and showed you PHP and Ajax. So my question to you is how is this the same as to what we just did? What are the similarities? different content based on some user action. So, when the page loads initially, it's going to have all these things in it. Right? Just like our menus, when the page loads initially, is going to have, you know, just like the example we had where it had all the menus. This case is going to have all the little articles. All right? What's the difference? What differences are between the user action? The users use a mouse over. They're going to use a click. All right. So you have a different event. All right. Another subtle difference is that in this case, one of them is always going to be showing, right? Whereas in our submenu example, with the submenus, when we initially loaded the page, some of the sub uh, some of the submenu or none of the submenus rather were showing. Whereas here, we're going to start out showing the first tab, JavaScript. Until you click another one. 
Then we're going to show that one until you click another one. Now, one other sort of added thing that will make this more tab-like, all right, is that in addition to showing and hiding, we can change the colors, all right, of the selected tab. So, for example, we could make all of our tabs gray. No, let me rephrase that. We could make the selected tag tab yellow and make the content area yellow. We could make the tags that are not selected gray. As we click on a tab, we could make the newly clicked on tag yellow and make the rest of the tags gray. So that way that really gives the tab effect. All right? To where it looks like that is part of that. Same thing, we're going to use CSS positioning to put that tab right on top of it. All right? Really, this there's not too much difference between this and the example that we um, went over. It's always good when you get an assignment or when you get any sort of project to sort of take a mental inventory of what is it that I know already? How is this like something I've done before? And in this case, how is it like something I've done before? We're showing and hiding things. All right, That's a fundamental part of this problem that we're showing and hiding things. How is this different? Well, we um, are, are not doing it with lists. We're doing it with articles. All right. Does that seem like a big deal? No. All right. It doesn't to me, of course. That's like the dentist saying it, it's not going to hurt me, right? All right. We're not using an on mouse over. We're using an on click. That's probably not a big deal, right? All you need to do is look up what the event is when the user clicks on something. And I already just said that two seconds ago, so you don't even have to look that up if you were listening closely there. The other thing is uh, we're going to use CSS to make sure the position of these work so that the tabs are right on top of the content. And last but not least, all right, we want to also change the color. So really, there's sort of one new thing in this that's brand new. But it's similar to what we've done before because we've changed CSS of an existing element. And it shouldn't be that much different to change the, C uh, to change the color than to change the visibility. The syntax of the command is going to look very, very, very similar. All right? So it's always good to sort of take that approach when we... Um, are looking at a new assignment. What have I done before that's like this? Um, what is different? And then the things that are different. Is it radically different than anything we've done before? Or is it maybe just a little bit different? That is, instead of changing the visibility, we're changing the color. All right. Now, next time we're going to look at what if you have multiple instructions, which is something that you need to do in a case like this, right? You need to um, change the visibility and set some things color. So we'll look at that next time um, in class. We'll probably also start validation, all right? Which is, which is one of the main uses 